do one of the board members mind being co-host so you can let folks in the meeting as we get started? It's easier on a computer. Basically, just as folks join, if you notice that I haven't admitted someone into the room, would you please let them in? Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. We will, uh, we're going to start tonight with some community updates. Um, I'm going to go first and just give three updates um, that are timely. One is that Representative Angela Romero and Representative uh, Sandra Hollins and Senator Luz Escamilla are holding their annual legislator town hall uh, on Tuesday, the 22nd of this month. Um, I've uploaded a, an attachment to the, the Zoom chat here uh, with information on that event. Um, if you have questions, you can click through the link uh, on there. Basically, it'll be a webinar format and folks will be able to participate. If Representative Romero's here tonight, I'll have her talk a little bit more about it uh, during her time on the agenda. Um, but I don't know if she'll be here. Uh, the second thing I wanted to let everyone know about the proposal to redevelop Tejada's Market at uh, 11 or 1279 uh, Navajo Street is going before the Planning Commission on the 23rd of this month. I will post additional information in the chat about this, but if this uh, development is of interest to you and you're, you care about it, this is a chance to weigh in um, on that development. Like I said, I'll post a little bit more about that in the chat. Uh, and then the last thing, letting folks know, we've talked a lot about CIP applications, capital improvement plan applications. Those will start being reviewed and potentially put in prioritization by the mayor's office beginning this month and running through, uh, I believe, March or April. Um, so we have four that have been submitted. We're aware of four others in the neighborhood that were submitted by others that we're watching. Um, we are going to publish an annual report probably by the end of this week, and that will include a written summary of all the CIP applications and then a link to be able to participate in that process. So I'm not going to go over them in depth tonight, but wanted to let folks know that that process has started. Um, with that, uh, Diane, do you want to talk about the initiative that you're working on? Yes, I'd love to. Um, I'm Diane Budig, and I live in the Glendale neighborhood, and I am supporting uh, Becky Edwards. She would like to run against Mike Lee uh, for Utah U.S. Senator um, in order to make it onto the primary ballot in Utah. One of the ways that she can do that is by gathering 28,000 signatures. So I have a petition. Um, that I'm trying to get signatures for Becky. I would like to see another choice on the ballot. Becky's a, a great woman. Um, she is a moderate Republican and she has a lot of integrity. She believes in democracy and she believes that we can be a better people than we have been in politically. Uh, she does believe in our government and that our government can work for us. Um, if you'd like to get in touch with me, I can give you my cell cell number I can put it in the chat too but I'll give it to you it's 801-864-7443 just uh, text me is probably the best way because I don't tend to answer my phone if I don't recognize the number text me and uh, I'll get in touch with with you we'll make a plan and you can sign the petition the one um thing is you have to be a registered Republican in order to uh, sign the petition because in Utah the Republicans have a closed primary yeah. so um, that's easy enough to do if you want to change your registration uh, so that you can be involved because let's face it in Utah the Republican candidate is the candidate nine times out of ten that's going to win the election in November so uh, if you'd like to help Becky out, and I'd appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Any questions? Okay. Thanks, Diane. Thank you. Appreciate it, Turner. Yep. Uh, Ken from Sorensen Center, do you want to give an update? 
we're just doing community updates. So after Ken goes, uh, anyone from the community that wants to make an update can. And then we'll get into uh, public safety updates and elected official updates shortly. Thanks, Turner. Hi, everyone. My name is Ken Perko. I'm with the Sorensen campus on um, 9th West and California Avenue, the Sorensen Unity Center and the Multicultural Centers. Um, it's kind of the, the same update as I've given um, for the past few, many months, it seems, these days. Um, so we are still open for um, services by registration. Um, and so fitness center, boxing gym, basketball gyms, pool is open with limited hours. Um, and our tech center, as well as youth programs and um, the donated dental clinic. Um, we've also started doing um, VITA um, programming. Um, that's a volunteer income tax assistance um, through a partnership with Tax Help Utah. Um, I'll put their information in the um, chat. That's that, that organization is doing appointment only services. Um, and so it's just important for folks to know they can get their taxes done for free if they meet certain income thresholds, um, but they can make an appointment. And I'll, like I said, I'll put the contact info through there. Um, we do have a few looking ahead to the spring. Um, there's a few construction projects that are going to be happening on the campus. And as we get closer to those, I'll give more of an update on that. But that's kind of something we're looking forward to. Um, I will also say that like, as a city building or as city buildings, um, masks are still required in both of the campus buildings. Um, we do have masks at the entrances, but they all are required um, to enter the buildings. I have no idea when that will change. I also really don't know when um, programming will be expanded and kind of get back to normal. We are hoping for the spring. Um, there is a, at least there's planning for some youth sports to resume outside in the spring, um, but indoor programming is still um, kind of very limited to reservation only programs. Um, as always, I welcome um, any questions or comments uh, about the campus. Um, please feel free to put them in the chat or, or let me know if anybody has any comments and otherwise, thank you, Turner. Thanks, Ken. Uh, anyone else with a community update? I'd like to, Turner, if I could. Yeah, absolutely. Um, hello, Dennis Ferris um, with uh, VOA, Volunteers of America. Um, as we presented last month at this meeting, um, there is a proposal to move some of our facilities. Uh, Dennis, don't like you. Okay. Um, there is a proposal to um, move some of the VOA facilities to a building on Redwood Road. Um, just wanted to make myself available if anybody has any questions, concerns, comments um, regarding that or anything in general um, regarding homelessness. So if you've got anything now, feel free to chime in um, or I'll also put my contact info in the chat box. Thanks. Thanks, Dennis. And I'm going to put a link to a community conversation we had about the proposal that Dennis is talking about. So if you want additional information, you can go to that link. Thank you, Turner. Thanks, Dennis. I just want to say I like you, Dennis. <laughs> Thank you, Kat. Uh, any other updates? All right, uh, we'll transition over. We have um, Teresa from the University of Utah who's here to do a presentation on uh, the gentrification assessment plan that Salt Lake City is doing. Um, after Teresa, we um, will get into our elected official and public safety updates. So uh, Teresa, if you are on, feel free to go ahead. Thank you, Turner. And thank you everyone for letting me take five minutes of your time to quickly present a project that we are doing with the U. Um, I, I'm going to, it says disabled participant screen sharing. Would it be all right to share? Or can I just go ahead and present it uh, verbally? Let me make you a co-host real quick and that'll let you share. Thank you. There you go. Perfect, thank you. <clears throat> can everyone see my screen? Yes, okay, great. 
So some of you may have heard of this project before. I know there's been some communication with the council about this, but um, as, as Turner mentioned, I am part of the University of Utah City and Metropolitan Planning grad program. I'm also a board member of Dual Immersion Academy. So this is something that's close to home for me in terms of how this is affecting our education system. And what this uh, project is thriving in place is a Salt Lake City anti-displacement strategy that we are doing. And we have been taking part in this for about a year. And so this is for us to understand what is impacting Glendale and neighboring communities in terms of what that looks like with affordable housing, how is it impacting the businesses in the area, the school systems and so forth. And later down the road, what kind of strategies can we create from what we've learned? So when it comes to the makeup of who's participating, we have three organizations that are taking part. Baird is a national leader in affordable housing policy development with a deep commitment to ensuring those impacted by policy decisions are involved in shaping them. And then we have Berkeley that is a national leader in analyzing and understanding the focus of displacement. So the two of these organizations are working close with the University of Utah, uh, specifically Professor Garcia and Rigalon, and they are the ones that are engaging the grad program in order to be the boots on the ground to ensure that we are understanding the community needs, that we are interviewing families and anyone who in, is participating or a part of the communities that we are focusing on. So last year or last semester, we created a community story maps. And so there are a number of communities that are currently at risk for displacement and gentrification, Glendale being one of them. And so uh, together as a program, I believe so far we've interviewed over 200 people, but we've talked to significantly more individuals and we will continue to do those surveys. We've adjusted the survey to ask more detailed questions. These surveys were meant for us to understand what, the, uh, what community members cared about when it came to Glendale, what were the assets, what are the concerns, who did they go to, and looking forward, what are they most uh, worried about and what they would like for change to occur. And what, when it came to the findings and gathering those, there were a couple of things that stood out. One of which is how green space was the top of the list in terms of the assets that many of the residents mentioned. Um, because of the industrial area, they took great pride in being able to participate in all of the green spaces that Glendale has to offer and the recreational use. At the same time, they expressed concern in terms of, since there's more people coming in, they noticed that there might be a decline in um, the uptake of the green spaces and accumulation of refuse around the Jordan River Parkway and, and so forth. And so they hope that even if there's more people coming in, that they're still able to utilize these, these areas of the community like they did before. Uh, in terms of maintaining Glendale's cultural identity and history, we had a lot of residents that talked about how incredibly diverse, ethically and racially diverse Glendale is. That was a large um, part of their pride and the, the excitement and love towards Glendale, but they're also noticing a decrease in that as well, in terms of as more families are coming in and other families are in, essentially being pushed out, they notice that there is a decrease in the diversity and that also impacts the businesses that are here that reflect that diversity as well. We've had a few residents that mentioned safety and crime. Uh, we, we outlined that they said that years ago, crime was at a high and then it became safer, less crime, and they were able to go out and recreate and uh, participate in outdoor events. But now they're noticing that crime is, um, is increasing and, and what residents have said is that they've noticed that there's more drug use and they attribute some of that to individuals experiencing unsheltered homelessness. And then lastly is housing and displacement. It's affordable housing, lack of, it's unable to find homes in the area, it's trying to find resources in order to afford housing. And so some those were some of the themes that were popping up specifically from the interviews 
And so I'll share that link later on that will, um, that displays the story maps. It has quotes from those individuals. And those are just a few of the findings that we've noticed and, and the, there's definitely a lot more. But something that stood out to me is just how much people love Glendale uh, as a neighborhood, as a place to raise their families, the schools that are in the area and so forth. So what we're doing with this is we, for now, we're putting this all on a website that's accessible to the public called Thriving in Place. This is where the story. Uh, free fair February and then ask your uh, opinion on it and how much you're using it. Um, I think there was some figures released today by UT that shows a significant increase in ridership um, across the system, especially on the weekends, people getting out on using the front runner and, and things like that. So those are exciting um, news and hopefully that'll help uh, encourage state lawmakers to expand that kind of uh, benefit and that's something that the mayor would really like no, to see that was free. and uh, the other uh, the only other thing I had to share was from our police department the Salt Lake uh, Police Academy or excuse me Community Academy which is a five-week program for residents to learn more about uh, how the police department functions so what you do is you just fill out and submit an application they do a quick background check and then if there's enough spaces in the course um, you attend every Thursday night uh, during the month of March and um, so I will send a link to that as well um, and from our colleagues in the police department so that's all I have at this time is there any questions Doesn't look like it. Thanks, Josh. Thank you. All right. Uh, next, we'll go over to Council Member Pui. Hi. So I don't have a ton, but I will tell you a few things that I've been working on and a few updates from this last couple of weeks. Uh, the redistricting commission. Uh, uh, was selected. Um, we in District 2 had zero applicants for many, many weeks. And uh, I think all of us worked very hard to get applicants. And we ended up with seven applicants for District 2, which is a great number. Uh, amazing candidates. We uh, picked uh, one uh, Glendale, uh, a Glendale uh, neighbor, Marty Wilford, uh, to represent District two, but we also had a second seat uh, that we, you know, District two got, uh, and that is Daniel Cairo uh, to represent at large. So it's a it's a nine board member group, one per district and two at large, one for District four and one for District two, and the reasoning for having two extras. Um, is because District two and District four are likely the two districts that are going to change the most. District two, because it needs a lot more population uh, and district four, because it has a lot of population. So it's gonna shrink. Um, so that's why uh, we did it that way. Um, you know, so I'm very, very excited. I'm hopefully the other applicants, uh, we can get them involved in other boards. I was looking today, at trying to make a list of all the boards that district two doesn't have a representation uh, and trying to share it with them. And I'm gonna share it with you, Turner, to, to share with this uh, with this community council and see if we can get representation uh, in all the boards. And if you do apply, please let me know because I follow up with the administration about the application and try to find out what where is in the process and, um, and see if they can move them along. Um, so I would like to see more people involved from District 2, so please let me know if I can help. And I, I know that I talked about this, uh, I believe, last time. I also, uh, on traffic mitigation, I uh, I went on Monday to uh, Mountain View Elementary, right in front of uh, 1400 South and Navajo Street, um, and it was a disaster. And uh, uh, it, it was very problematic. The, the, the neighbors, uh, the parents of the, the the parents of the, uh, the kids told me how much of a problem it was. And on Monday I went in uh, and I was a, a traffic, um, 
uh, I was trying to help the kids cross the street uh, for the whole day uh, in the morning and in the afternoon. And it was, it was very problematic. So I follow up with the administration on that uh, and streets uh, is looking into that intersection now and see what they can do about it. Um, so uh, if there are issues like that, um, I would love to, to come look at them, uh, highlight the problem and see if I can uh, make a case to the administration about the urgency of some of those intersections. Again, the speeding is a big problem um, across the board. Um, and it's, it's, it, there's a lot of, of you and a lot of neighbors have told me how much of a problem it is. And I would like to hear feedback from you at some point uh, hopefully through text or calls or emails uh, about 20 is plenty and your thoughts on that uh, about you know reducing this the speed limit for from 25 to 20 in residential neighborhoods um, there are quite a bit of studies about this uh, about the benefits of that um, and I would like your thoughts on this um, what else uh, Josh mentioned free fair February I would like us to see if we can all commit to you know take uh, a bus or trucks between the in this month, because they are using those numbers uh, of ridership to see if people will use it more, uh, and if this is a lasting thing that they could do. You know, if they can actually have free fare across the board all year round. So, I think I think all of us uh, should do an effort in trying to use public transportation uh, and, and you know. Uh, hopefully push up the numbers because I believe that this is very beneficial. Uh, about crossing guards though, I wanted to mention that the administration is struggling with hiring. There's about 20 openings. There's a lot of intersections that are going out without crossing guards because we are not hiring enough. The pay is not great. It's $15 an hour, uh, but you work about two or three hours a day uh, and you know, in the morning and in the evening. Um, it's 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 almost like a you know, service to the community. So if, if you know of anybody um, that has, uh, you know, will like to do this, uh, I will share the links with you about applying for that. And the last thing I wanted to say is uh, this last couple of weeks, I've been working very hard on increasing my mailing list. And by me as Council District 2 mailing list, I already added many dozens of people into the mailing list. Is one of the few is one of the lists that has the few amount of participants in it, um, both in Spanish and English, um, and I'm I'm pushing very hard on this. So I'm going to share the link with you. You get an email from from the council every time that the a meeting is done just to know what we talked about. Um, there is some very useful information in there. Um, oh. And I'm going to share that. If you haven't signed up, I would love to have you in there. Um, and one more thing, we do have some yard signs about uh, for speeding uh, to to lower your speeding. Um, I got about 25 this last Friday out around that school. The parents that wanted them. Um, if you want one of those yard signs, I will deliver them to you. I just need to know. So I'm going to send you the, the link of all that where to request it. Um, and I think that it really is my update. And if you guys have any questions, please let me know. Any questions for Council Member Pui? All right. It doesn't look like it. Um, I will share the link on Facebook as well, Councilman. Thank you. All right, uh, we're going to move over to public safety updates. We'll start with the fire department. Someone here representing the fire department. Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay, thanks for having us. Uh, my name is uh, Brian Staley. I'm the uh, captain here, one of the captains here at Station 14. Uh, we're located about uh, Bangor Highway in California. Um, we're just east of, of Bangor off California, and uh, we're happy to be here. Um, we don't have much for announcements or any kind of great news. Um, we'd just like to encourage you to um, check your smoke alarms um, and also your CO alarms, especially in the winter. Um, and in ways to avoid CO poisoning, you know, if uh, we suggest, you know, if the power goes out and you need to use a generator, that you don't put the generator inside and also keep your genera generators away from outdoor, um, any windows and keep them outdoors and don't use your gas grills. Um, 
keep them away from, from windows as well. We also suggest that uh, don't try to heat your home with a gas stove top or an oven. And uh, I actually, about 18 years ago this, this winter, we responded on a traffic accident that uh, turned into eventually into a car fire. And the reason was is they were driving around in their car with a barbecue grill in the back seat um, to heat the inside of their car. So we suggest don't to do, not to do that as well. Um, that is a true story. I'm not lying or, or making any of that up. So um, just just be smart. Check your check your smoke alarms um, and also check your CO alarms as well. Um, if you don't have those, we'd suggest you get them. Um, our other, I guess, big item to announce is that we're um, we're going to be hiring soon, and so we would like to invite anybody who is interested to um, check us out. Um, I'm going to send here a link right here where they can go um, slc.gov slash fire slash careers um, where they can get more information about being a firefighter. It's a great job. Um, I have nothing but good things to say about it and it's for anybody. It's not just for, um, I, I, I don't know. It, it's, it's just a great job for everyone. Um, and the last day for um, the submit an application would be March 31st. And you can go to that that link and, and and get more information about that. So that's about it. And if anybody has any questions, I'd love to answer them. Thank you. Any questions for the fire department? Uh, it doesn't look like it. Thank you for being here. All right, here. thank you. You guys have a great night. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to Detective Oliver, Salt Lake City Police Department. Yeah, I really like going after the the uh, the mayor's office and the city council office because I don't have anything to say. Um, no, I'll just reiterate what uh, Josh said about we do have a Citizens Academy coming up. If anybody has any questions, concerns, or want to kind of see what the training is that police department goes through, I highly recommend it. It's um, it's a great, uh, I believe, five weeks. Um, it is a time commitment, but you get to see the the backside of law enforcement in the city. So we have some great trainers and some great. Uh, Great people that teach that class, so I recommend it. Um, are there any questions, concerns uh, that people are seeing in the community that uh, we need to talk about right now? Detective Oliver Levi here. Uh, Hi, Levi. 7300 South. Hi. Uh, real quick, I've called the precinct a few times, not a precinct, sorry, the dispatch number. Uh, we are seeing people come up on 1700 South again and park semi trucks and, and some RVs overnight. There are some even right now. Uh, is there a way to maybe put a reoccurring reminder uh, to the officers like we have a no parking sign allowed from 11 p.m. to 5 a.m. If they can come by even once a week and get people to move along, I see that it helps us a lot. We see less drive by shootings, less prostitution, less needles when we don't have anyone parking there overnight. Yeah, in fact, um, last Friday night, I was working out the industrial area on some street racers and there were some calls on 17th South that uh, that went not responded to because we had so many calls for service. So I have put that back. I've kind of made that a, a, another priority. Um, the city and the community put a lot of time into that 17th South cleanup. So we want to we want to keep it clean. Um, so, yes, that'll be a priority. And I'll even start hitting that on, on my weekends when I'm out working the street racers as well. Thanks for the heads awesome. up. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate all the all the help you've given us. You bet. Thank you. Yep. Diane, I see a, a hand. Yes, um, I'm just wondering, there's getting to be quite the homeless camp just north of the Fife wetlands. I think that's just outside of Glendale's borders, but it's really a mess there. Is there anything? Is that your department or <laughs> whose department is that? So that'll be a combination of the health department. Um, uh, the city homelessness and and Salt Lake City Police Department usually do a standby for security reasons. So uh, we are aware of that camp, um, and I believe it's on the agenda to be cleaned up shortly. Um, okay. Probably, I'm not quite sure. We meet every Thursday, and that's kind of when we get the orders of what locations we're going to clean up. But I drove by that area today, um, and it is it's a lot fuller than it was a couple weeks ago. So it's yeah, that's, quite built up. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll we'll try and make that a priority as well. Great, thank you. Yeah, the health department leads the abatements for the the city um, on the larger abatements, 
and we would just provide um, manpower for cleanup and then the the security part of it. Okay, great. Thank you. You bet. All right, no more questions. We can just go through some quick numbers if that's all right. I have Turn a question. Over. Oh, go for it, Stephanie. Yeah, um, there was an incident on my street yesterday that a couple of neighbors and community members have been asking about that I wanted to inquire about. There were, it, it was a plain clothes operation. And that's, I think, what made people a little bit on edge that there was something larger going on. There were about 20 undercover cars and I counted 25 plus plain clothes officers and a helicopter circling. So I'm wondering if you can give any more information um, that I could pass along to my neighbors that are wondering, yeah, what's going on. Is this the same pictures that council member Pui sent me? Is that? Um, I, I, I don't, I don't think so, but I think it, you mentioned that it was, uh, there were several instances where this ha was happening that day. So it might, yeah, be might be on the same day. So the one that we were talking about was on Oakley street and it looks like it was an FBI um, op. That was the one on Oakley Street, and they had four or five locations that they hit in the city on the same day. So um, resource-wise, we don't have access to a helicopter, so it, it was probably the FBI that was doing it. If it's plain clothes and there aren't any markings on, on the, the vans or any of the vehicles, um, chances are pretty good that it's going to be a federal, a federal um, hit. So, and it was drug, and it was drug related. So where could I go to find more information about that? Um, besides, of course, talking to my neighbors. I know that's a great <laughs> option, which well, uh, I can. So when the when the feds usually do their their ops, um, it's a little bit more secretive as as far as even us getting information on it um, because of the, the security aspect. So I can I can ask around through the FBI. I do have a guy that works in the office actually has a wife that works in the FBI. And that's how I found out about those four or five hits that were on that, that day. So, um, I'll see if I can find something and maybe direct, direct you to that, that resource. And it might, um, even be on these, the Salt Lake city FBI website. They might post something about the, the, uh, the, um, drug bust that they did over the week, over the last week. Okay, thank you. And I, I'm if are you close to Oakley Street? No, mine would have been on um, what's that street? It, it was on the Magdalene. No, I don't know what the name of the street is because the street changes names two Herbs. times. Okay. So um, okay. I'll check and see if I can get the exact address. Well, the general addresses for those those um, busts, and then I'll let I can let you know next meeting. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. And if you want to send me an email, I can even let you know earlier than that. Um, I'll okay. leave my e email in the uh, chat. Thanks. I'm, um, will you CC me on that, Detective Oliver, so that I can send it out to our newsletter? Sure. Or just info out to the community? Sure. Thank you. Um, let me hurry and type this in. Okay, and there are any other questions before I get into some of the numbers? I'm just going to send that. I All right. Question. I'm sorry. Oh. Go ahead. Yeah, so I guess I don't really know much about the abatement process and I'm kind of new to the area. Um, and I do work in the social service sector. So all my exposure to our homeless neighbors is through my work. And I don't know much about the background of what the abatements look like. And I was wondering if you could speak, Detective Oliver, a little bit to what those look like on the ground and like kind of walk through the process. I know that's maybe a, a pretty broad, a pretty broad question, but um, no, that's that's a good question, and actually Dennis can help us with that too, because so, VOA is is pretty active in planning those. Um, so Dennis, if you're there, could you kind of go on your side of it as far as the non law enforcement side? I certainly can. I will push back to, however, on that VOA is active in planning them. Um, VOA oh, yeah, is not planning them. active in, in reach. Yeah. Sorry. I didn't mean uh, it that way. The, we are VOA is definitely with their homeless outreach program is very active in trying, trying to prevent them, frankly. Um, if we can um, offer enough resources to get people into um any sort of resource center or shelter of some sort, um, connecting with case management so that we can get them onto um, a better path somewhere else so that an abatement isn't necessary. Um, so that's how we're involved. Um, and then as far as an abatement, how, how it occurs and what it looks like, 
Um, well, much like what Diane mentioned with the camps in the uh, around the Fife Wetlands and in the Ninth South River Park, um, spaces like that, that as the camps build up, there is a meeting each week within the city and with partners, service providers, um, law enforcement, health departments to look through the list of here's all the camps in town, here's the worst ones and why they need to be dealt with. Um, and, in, and then if that's the case, how do we best deal with them? Um, along the way, at every step, VOA is trying to do outreach, um, but there are times when it comes to the point that, yes, we need to come in there and the space needs to be cleaned. Um, so on a baby looks a lot like when your mom comes in the living room and says, Hey, pick up your stuff or I'm going to throw it away. Um, the health department kind of comes in and does the same thing. So they roll in and have, um, campers move their stuff and it's, they're posted, usually try to do 48 hours in advance. There have been times when it's as, um, only 24 hours in advance, but there is always some, um, some notice in there. So they've got some time to be able to move um, to somewhere else. It's not a question of you have to, you're going to jail or anything like that, um, because frankly, there's no room there either. Um, but instead that it's, we've got to get in there and um, just clean the space because there are some um, health issues surrounding the trash or bio waste that is building up. Um, so they're given the opportunity to move and then health department um, with other partners comes in to clean and then the police are usually at least present um, but just to keep the peace um, make sure that um, everyone is safe there have been death threats frankly in the past um, to people at the health department so we want to be able to avoid that um, how'd that do JC or Eldon did that answer the questions yeah that, um, JC how did that go yeah I I think that answered my question. Um, I guess I'm curious as to, um, Dennis, you mentioned that there is a, there's the, the possibility of, oh, we're not going to send you to jail because there's no room there. Are there specific offenses that, um, that individuals who are- you, you cut off on that last part, JC. Are there what? Uh-oh. Okay, if she if she hops back in and it, feel free to interrupt me, JC, if you can hear me. Um, otherwise, I'll try to answer what I think the question is. Um, police, this is an abatement is not a law enforcement action. Um, it is a health department cleaning the land action. Um, so it is not about they're not running warrants. They're not running through trying to catch people or trying to put them in jail. Um, the only reason someone, frankly, would go to jail and feel free to jump in and correct me, Detective Oliver, at any time um, is if there were a physical interaction in the moment. Um, there's nobody wants to take them to jail. That's not why it's happening. Um, it's just a question of trying to clean up the property for everybody's use. Okay. And this is, this is all in public, like on public lands oftentimes, or like, I know that medians, like a lot of the times where camp camping happens, is mm -hmm. considered public land. Is that, is that kind of the issue? Yes. Yes. Um, the park strip, the area between the sidewalk and the curb is, um, technically the responsibility of the property owner to maintain, but the part of the agreement in anyone's um, deed is um, that the public maintains a right of way through that space. So quite honestly, technically, officially, um, every park strip, it may as well be a public park. Um, so yeah, that's when those events happen, it's because it is a public space. There are times um, when sometimes the health department will partner with private property owners to, um, for assistance in cleaning up camps that have built up on private space as well. It's relatively rare. Um, it is most often the responsibility of the property owner, but the administration also understands that there are times when um, the buildup was rapid or uh, extreme and not necessarily the fault of the property owner so willing to help out and and when those private property cleanups that the health department also helps on we we do the same thing it's just a, a standby um for security reasons and that's it so i really like how dennis says it's not a law enforcement issue it's it's a health department cleanup 
So, know the, I know the police catch a lot of flack for just standing around um, at these abatements. Um, but personally, I prefer that. <laughs> I would rather they just be standing around rather than um, trying to um, in, make anyone's life more miserable in that moment because it's already a pretty bad day for everybody. Um, so if that answered anybody's questions or if JC, if you've got any other follow-ups um, and then again, my contact info is in the chat box. So if anybody wants to reach out and who maybe does like me and want to hear what I have to say, then I can feel free to jump in. Yeah, thank you. That did answer my question. Thanks. Sure. Turner, if there's any other questions that we can answer or I can just do some quick numbers. The numbers are a little bit, um, like I said before, a little makes me a little nervous because we had a couple warm days. And so those couple warm days kind of increased our crime. So uh, as it gets warmer, I'm a, unfortunately, I think we're going to see um, some some spikes in, in crime in not only just District 2, but across the city. So uh, I don't know if you got time, Turner, or, or what you want me to do. Uh, yeah, please give give numbers. Okay, so um, and this is the the numbers that we have through CompStat uh, through two two thirteen. So for three days ago, and I'm still waiting for last year's uh, con uh, what is congregation? That's not the word. Conglomerate numbers is that's probably not even a word either. But the the mass in, um, numbers for all of last year. When we get those, I'll provide those to you. Um, but for the last 40, uh, 28 days, um, we saw an increase of 87.5% uh, in robberies. That was an increase of three. So we are seeing an increase in that. We're seeing an increase in aggravated assault families, so domestic violence issues. We saw an increase of um, 10 of those, and we saw a 125.8% increase in aggravated assault non-family. So um, like one of the stories that one of the issues that we saw that hit actual national news was the the uh, the person that went into the or was invited into a home to use the shower and ended up slitting the homeowner's throat that one is what's considered a, a non or an ag assault non-family and unfortunately that made a horrendous crime um, made national news so for violent crimes over the last 28 days we saw an 87 point five percent increase just in district two so that's that makes me nervous um when we had just a couple days of warm weather uh what it's going to be like when it really starts to warm up for property crimes we also saw um an increase of 31.2 percent in motor vehicle thefts so we went from 40 the average of about 40 over the last five years to 53 so saw 12 more that's not a good sign either um <coughs> sorry yeah, I just started choking. So if you can, oh goodness. Okay, so if so if you can just remember not to um, warm up your car in the morning because a lot of our stolens are still stolen with the keys in it. So, um, are there any questions on those numbers? I'm gonna drink some water. Sorry. I, I don't have a question specific to the numbers, um, but figured I would ask about drive-by shootings and whether you're seeing an increase, decrease, or about the same. Increase. We have seen a, a quite a bit increase on that, and our gang task force um, works specifically with those. But we're seeing that uh, in Districts 1 and Districts 2. And that's, like I, I've said in the past, it's kind of like a ping pong match. If, if you have a, a drive-by in an area in Glendale, um, you can guarantee a couple of days you're going to have a drive by up in Rose Park. Um, so yeah, we are definitely we have definitely seen an increase in um, drive bys. Thank you, Detective. Uh, Kimberly, did you have a question? No. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Jordan. I just wanted to. I I know that we were on. This is it. A completely different uh, change of topics, but uh, there's two bills I've been working on. One is moving along, and I would like, you know, if you feel like it's a good bill to support it, and by that I mean that you email your senator or representative, but don't only email yours. Uh, my advice will be to email other ones too. Um, so SB Senate Bill 196 uh, is traffic enforcement amendments. Uh, is uh, led by Senator uh, Stevenson and is to create, uh, allow municipalities to use 
uh, technology for traffic enforcement. Um, you know, there is a lot of white support on this. Uh, you know, red cap, red light cameras, or um, uh, other other uh, devices for speed mitigation. Uh, Denver has a very similar system, and I saw it uh, firsthand when I, you know, I travel a lot to Denver for work, uh, and uh, it will try to curve some of the speeding that we're seeing. Uh, if you feel like you have used, you know, this is a good bill, I would like you to email legislators for that. Uh, then Senate Bill 53 uh, is driver speeding amendments. I worked closely with Jen Jenny Iwamoto on this. It, it was it's on the third revision. I think there may be a fourth one very soon. Uh, I testified on that one. Uh, it is for uh, some of the street racing we've seen. Uh, the, there is uh, the street racing that is happening in Salt Lake is happening in District 2 and the industrial part. Um, so it is a very good bill, in my opinion. Uh, and I will, if you, it's already passed the Senate, so it's going to the, the floor of the House. It's going to be in committee and in the House, and then hopefully in the floor of the House. It seems like it's going to pass, but it's still your involvement will be very useful. Uh, that one is to punish those organizing and speed racing. Uh, and there is some numbers in there of what, how do you, how do you uh, classify some someone speed racing? So, thank you. Sorry for that. And I just want to second that the, the uh, Senate Bill Fifty Three. Um, since I've been out in the industrial area for almost every weekend on these street racers, it would be a really good law enforcement tool for us to have, um, and that would would help me out a ton. We just don't have the officers, um, especially on the weekends. There's nobody patrolling the uh, industrial area. So uh, just because of a lack of officers, the good news is we have a class, a brand new class that's in session, a class that just came out of, of the academy that are in the FTO program. So that's going to be about a 30, around 30, hopefully, cross your fingers, officers that so should be out in the next, oh, I'd say 20 weeks. So that's a plus. But again, the industrial area just doesn't have patrol on the weekends. So that's why we're seeing that increase in the street, street racing. Sorry about that. I uh, lost my mute button. Um, I've shared links to both bills in the chat and on Facebook if you're interested. Uh, so you can look at those. Um, any questions for Detective Oliver before we move on? All right. Uh, thank you for your time, Detective. All right. Uh, with that, we're going to move on to our state elected officials. I don't see any of them on the call, but if that's incorrect, will you speak up? Okay. Um, so now we're gonna move on. Um, we will move forward with the treasurer election. I, or the, wow, treasurer, the webmaster election. Um, <laughs> I have shared the link to the nomination form. As of right now, we only have one person, but we have two. Um, so we have two folks that have signed up to potentially be our webmaster. Uh, what I'll do, we're going to let these folks introduce themselves, and then we're going to do some committee updates, and we'll do the election after the committee updates. That way, everyone has a chance to fill out the ballot uh, and, and participate in the process, and we'll give a little bit of time for folks to do that. Um, so the first person that I'd like to introduce uh, is Jenny Erickson. Um, and then we had Marlene Little sign up as well. So if Marlene, if you would join the, the Zoom call to introduce yourself, um, we'll have you go after Jenny. Uh, Jenny, do you want to start us off? Sure. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Jenny Erickson. Um, I've lived in Glendale for several years now. Um, and I, I think it was after the January Glendale meeting, I noticed that there um, the webmaster role hadn't been filled um, after that month. So I reached out to Turner and um, wanted to just see if I could get involved um, as far as uh, the webmaster role is concerned. Um, and I have uh, 15 years of graphic design, marketing, web experience, um, and I've been doing work with um, the Crossroads Urban Center for several years now. So. 
um, just wanted to throw my name out there and um, see if I can be a, a resource for the council. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, Marlene, are you on the call? Oh, okay. Uh, Marlene just put in the chat on Facebook that she did not sign up. Um, so as of right now, Jenny is our only candidate. Is there anyone else on the call that is interested? If not, I think what I'll do is move that by acclamation, we elect Jenny as the webmaster. But before we do that, kind of final call, if you are interested. All right, well, I'm gonna move that we elect uh, Jenny Erickson by uh, acclamation to the role of webmaster. And just to be clear, uh, Jenny is filling uh, a role. So her term will run from February until um, January of two years from now. Normally the webmaster is elected in January, but as we mentioned at last week's or last month's meeting, uh, we didn't have a candidate for webmaster, so that election wasn't held. So filling the next, I guess, what, uh, 23 months of a 24 month term. Um, with that, I'll put forward the nomination that we elect uh, Jenny by acclamation. We do need a second on the motion, if someone would second. A second. A second. Third. <laughs> uh, we'll give it to Diane. Uh, and with that, uh, we'll call the vote. Um, this vote is non-debatable, but if you would just raise your hand or say yes verbally, uh, we'll go ahead and, and have the vote. And if you're opposed, please speak up and say no. All right. I don't see any no's. All right. Thank you all very, very much. Uh, congratulations, Jenny, on being our new webmaster. Um, so I'm going to give some updates on committees. And then at our board meeting last month, there was a... Uh, a question that came up about the board term lengths. So I'm going to go over those again uh, after the, the committee updates. Earl, do you have your hand up uh, for a question? Doesn't look like No, it. I was just playing around. Sorry. <laughs> okay, just making sure. All right. Um, so the first committee that I'm going to give an update on is our Friends of Glendale Parks Committee. So we have, uh, for the last about, well, now nine months, uh, we've had an intern named Jake that's been working with the council to create uh, a Friends of Glendale Parks Committee. And the idea of this committee is to raise funding and to really support our parks and public spaces. So. Um, what they've been doing for the last couple of months and that we'll actually have presented to you all in either April or May at our public meeting is they've been going through all of our parks in Glendale to do an index of what's happening in those parks and what resources are available in those parks and then what amenities are included in those parks. So the number of um, soccer fields, the number of basketball hoops, all of that is being measured. And once we have that done, we're going to start working on implementing some projects and, and raising some funding. So as an example, Bend in the River has been an area uh, that we repeatedly are emailed about because it's kind of fallen into disrepair. And so we will be working uh, kind of after we finish this initial, initial assessment to work on projects in specific parks. So uh, we will have a public survey for our neighbors that's going to come out. Um, I'm hoping in March, but it may end up being a little bit later than that. Um, but we will talk about it at our March meeting, um, and then we'll talk about it uh, repeatedly on social media and make sure that everyone has a chance to participate in that, basically asking um, what you'd like to see in our parks, what issues you see, uh, and, and things like that. So um, watch this space and we'll bring it back. Um, the next part, uh, the next committee is Keep Glendale Beautiful. Um, working on organizing cleanups in our neighborhood. 
In January, we applied for funding through Keep America Beautiful, who is our national partner. Uh, we applied for $5,000 in funding. And if we get that, we'll spend about $1,000 of that on flowers and wildflowers um, and some natural plants that we want to plant along the Jordan River Parkway and in some of our public spaces. Um, we're also working on getting some new cleanup equipment, um, some roll away dumpsters and things like that, that'll just make it easier for us to organize cleanups. Uh, and then the last update from Keep Glendale Beautiful is we've decided to organize our cleanups on the first Saturday of every month. So our next cleanup is going to be on the Nine Line Trail uh, on the 5th of March. And we are going to meet at the intersection of the Nine Line Trail and Redwood Road. Um, I would recommend parking off of Navajo or 1400 West on Hayes Avenue uh, because we will be walking east from where we start the cleanup. So your car will end up in the middle uh, of where we are walking that day. And um, you, our cleanups are all ages, all abilities will provide all the equipment. You just have to, to show up. Um, and we'd encourage you to RSVP, which you can do through our Facebook events uh, or on our website. Um, and those are held from 10 to 11 on the first Saturday of the month. Um, and like I said, the next one's on the Nine Line Trail. Uh, the next update is the Glendale Arts Committee, and I'll have Sarah give that one. Hello, hello. Uh, I'm Sarah Wolf, and um, started the Arts Committee recently. Um, after the after there was a survey done in the neighborhood, um, asking people what they valued and what they're interested in seeing more of, there was a lot of commentary about uh, wanting more arts in our community. So um, the endeavor that I'm working on right now is an event called Art at the Confluence, um, which would take place at the Three Creeks Confluence Park on April 16th, which is a Saturday uh, from 10 to four. That's the tentative time right now. Um, we've raised most of the money uh, to make it happen. Still need uh, just under a thousand more dollars. If you know anybody who owns a business who might be interested and willing to uh, pitch in a hundred bucks, 50 bucks, um, that would be awesome. And I also would love and need some assistance in just bringing this event to fruition. Um, we're all volunteers here and sometimes uh, time is particularly short. So um, if if you or anybody you know is, is invested in bringing arts to our community, reach out to me. I'll put my email in the, um, in the chat box and I would love to hear from you. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and I just wanna tack on one additional small project that we're working on. Um, there was a teacher at Riley Elementary School um, who passed away over Labor Day of last year from cancer and the school community reached out to us about building a memorial garden and memorial space at the back of Riley Elementary School. And we, uh, what the community council is helping organize is a mural project to, to memorialize that teacher. And we received the funding to do the, the mural at the site there. The school is also adding some community gardens and little free libraries. Uh, we'll be donating two little free libraries to them as well, um, really to just create a space for the community to, to remember uh, the, the teacher that passed away. And um, I only know her first name off the top of my head. We've talked about Miss Jess quite a bit uh, in our meetings, but I don't know that I know her last name. Um, but uh, with that project, we will be doing, uh, we'll be hiring a, an artist to come in and actually paint the mural and we'll be encouraging the community to participate in the design of the mural and help us pick the finalists. So that will, we'll be publishing the call for artists in March. Uh, and so if you know artists, uh, we will have a budget to pay them and to memorialize uh, the, the teacher there uh, at, at Riley Elementary School. Um, and then I'm gonna mention one other project. It's art adjacent, 
uh, but transportation related. So we love a good crossover project. Um, one of the things uh, that's been repeatedly brought up uh, to me is the issue of speeding on Emory Street. And we, uh, we, we're working within the bigger city processes to look at fixing some issues here, potentially a raised crosswalk, something like that. Um, that's obviously a longer term uh, solution that we'll, we'll explore. Um, but in the short term, what we're looking at doing at this intersection here at 1000 South and Emory Street is uh, we are going to paint a street sized mural there and create a fun, beautiful little artistic corner there and engage the students of Parkview Elementary to paint something, whether it's their school mascot, something like that. But the idea is that we're going to decorate the crosswalks, decorate the intersection. It's obviously not a permanent solution, but there's pretty good uh, evidence out there that public art naturally slows down traffic. And what we're hoping is by in, in, uh, engaging the school community that we can also engage all the parents that are dropping kids off there and folks that drive uh, through the school area there. So we're doing that at that intersection. Uh, and then the other one that I have heard just a ton about is this intersection here uh, out in front of Dual Immersion Academy at Navajo Street and Glendale Drive. So we're going to do the same thing there, uh, paint this crosswalk and paint uh, the intersection there with just some fun public artwork to build some community identity. We also uh, are encouraging the city to hopefully put a green bike station in here as a nice starting place for folks riding bikes. Um, and then potentially on the nine line as well. Those are obviously longer term projects, but the two that we're excited about that we will do this summer is painting these two intersections. So corner of Navajo and Glendale, and then 1000 South uh, and Emory. I don't have a lot of details on it. We're still coordinating with the city, uh, but we'll be sure to invite everybody and let you know when it's gonna happen. And uh, you can come out and do the giant paint by numbers with us. So uh, another fun project we'll be working on this summer. Um, on that note, we hear a lot about transportation issues. Um, and so at our last board meeting, the board talked about creating a transportation committee to explore transportation issues. Uh, I don't have a big update on that, but by our March meeting, I expect we'll bring something to the community to approve. Uh, and then the same thing, um, an emergency response committee uh, was mentioned a couple of years ago after the earthquake. Uh, I don't remember, I don't know if folks remember, but there was so much misinformation, um, kind of scary things happening. People were kind of, uh, didn't really know what to do. Um, and we're hoping to create an emergency response committee um, to at least share what contingency plans are out there and do some emergency planning messaging here in Glendale. So again, not a lot of details on that one, but we will be bringing it back to the community uh, in the future um, for action. So if you're interested in any of the things we've mentioned, Friends of Glendale Parks, uh, Keep Glendale Beautiful, Glendale Arts Committee, or Transportation or Emergency Planning, uh, please reach out to us because we'd love to have you involved uh, as a volunteer. Um, that's the end of the committee updates that I have. Uh, any board members want to give an update? Uh, Levi, I wondered if you wanted to talk, if you're still here. Oh, I think Levi's gone. OK. Um, I'm at the end of committee updates. Any questions? Um, so the last item of business I just wanted to talk about was the terms and the bylaws of the council. So you may remember uh, in December, the, we voted to approve new bylaws, and there were a couple of changes that were made to the old bylaws. Um, I am putting a link to the new one there on our website. So if you need to access those, uh, you'll have access. But at our board meeting, there was a question on officer terms. So I just wanted to come back to this and revisit it so that everybody's very clear uh, about what the terms are. So when we approved the new bylaws in December, uh, the only two active board terms that didn't expire right after the bylaws were approved were our secretary and our treasurer. Um, so they were in the middle of their term with the new bylaws. And we made the decision to 
just grandfather in and continue on their terms. So the next time that the, the treasurer and the secretary were scheduled to be, election, to be elected, even before the bylaws were changed, was next January. And so we just decided to stick with that term. Uh, the treasurer and the secretary will be up for election in January of next year with seven at-large board members. So those seven at-large board members serve a one-year term. The secretary, treasurer, vice chair, and webmaster will serve a two-year term. So our treasurer and secretary will be elected next year. Our webmaster and vice chair were elected this year. So two years from now, they'll be up. And then the chair's term was changed to three years. And that was done for two reasons. One, to give the chair the opportunity to onboard all of the officers and make sure that there's a good transition happening. Um, in the past, the chair, vice chair, and second vice chair were all elected at the same time. Um, and that meant that we had a lot of times where institutional knowledge was like wiped out uh, because the whole leadership changed all at once. And so now the, the chair will serve a three-year term to onboard those officers and board members. And then the other thing that a three-year term for the chair does is means that the chair is elected alternatively between the vice chair and uh, webmaster and then the secretary and treasurer. So those three officers will be elected um, in kind of alternating terms so that there's, there's good alternation and, and breakup of the term limits. Um, any questions on that? I just wanted to cover that. Um, I wanna make sure that anybody that has questions on the bylaws that you have access to them. Uh, so the link there in the chat is available for you if you wanna read all of the bylaws. Those were the biggest changes that we made in December. Um, otherwise, everything else was kind of smaller. Uh, I would encourage you to watch the recordings of our November and our December meetings where we went in depth on the bylaws so uh, that you can see those and, and make sure that you're aware of the changes that were made. With that, I think we're at the end of our agenda. Any other questions? Any issues people are seeing that they'd like us to address or put on an agenda? Thank you all. And I, I just like to point to Dennis's comment in the chat about reaching out to him regarding homelessness issues. Thank you, Dennis. All right. If there's no other business or any other items, I think we can go ahead and adjourn. I'll stay on after we end the public meeting if anybody has questions or wants to chat. Thank you, Turner. Thanks, Turner. Thank you, everybody.